me to Hebrews chapter 11 verse 4 and then also let's go ahead and uh, look in Genesis chapter 4 Hebrews 11 verse 4 before we share together what I believe the Lord has for us and in his message folks we need to pray we are living at a time when humankind is not doing very well We've got a lot of hurting people around us, a lot of dire circumstances throughout the globe. And it is time for the people of God who serve this great God, that his greatness might be made known, amen? That he might be seen. He is great. In his ungreatness, mankind needs to be able to recognize that. Somehow, our prayers have a part in that. So, dear people, let's go before the Lord in prayer right now. Just take a moment and just as David plays, just in the silence, you go before the Lord. The times that are needful, the times that are hurting, times that are critical he is great give them to him take a moment and pray can't fathom it we can't understand it we come to you by faith not because it makes sense Lord not because it somehow fits in a spreadsheet or in some kind of an essay but rather Lord simply because our hearts know by faith we don't see it but we understand it by faith And so, Father, by faith, we ask for your greatness to be made known. We come before you, praising you, exalting you. And, Lord, we pray that throughout this world, you would be known for who you are. Your wisdom and your power might rule the day. Lord, we pray for so many different areas, so many different things. Lord, our friends in Louisiana are scared right now. Even as we speak on this beautiful day, we realize the storm approaches, if not there already. Destruction, flooding, it seems imminent, Lord, taking place even as we speak. Lord, I pray that right now, that child, that mother, that senior adult would find the answer to their fear and they would see you in your greatness. Lord, keep them safe. Lord, protect them. Lord, allow the storm to pass. Oh, Father, when they walk in the sunlight once more, might they understand who is the one who gives it. Lord, your greatness upon them this day. Lord, throughout our nation, as people battle with pestilence and disease, some we know, some we don't, Lord, whatever it is, Father, you are greater, you are bigger, you are more, you are greater, Lord. And Father, whatever we do in our midst, might you be the one who shows your greatness in this dire day. 
Father, we need you. So for the one who's in the hospital bed right now, for the family who cannot be with him, Lord, for the one who finds their life critical on a very physical level, oh, Father, let them see greatness. Let them see who you are. Let them see your power. And Father, we pray for healing that does not come from anything but your hand. Heal us, Lord. And yes, at this time, physically, Lord, might we be healthy. Father, we also understand that there are some things in this world that are hurting. Crisis that extends beyond our borders. Lord, right now, brothers and sisters in Christ are in Afghanistan and they are scared. They are worried and they are concerned and every right to be so. Their world has been turned upside down in a matter of days. Oh, Father, strengthen them, support them. We know what has taken place and we know what's going to, Lord. We know that people will lose their lives because they trust you, because they follow you. Father, might their martyr's voice cry out of your power and your greatness. And yet, even in the midst of the evil that is in that land, I pray for your power and greatness to be made known. Lord, I pray for those who have a testimony to give, for those who have a word to share. Father, might they hear you and nothing else. Father, for those who serve our country on foreign soil right now, Lord, I pray you protect them. Certainly everyone else, Lord. But Father, our hearts are torn as we see what has taken place this week. We grieve and mourn for families who have lost someone close to them. Father, please protect the troops that are there. Protect them in their goodness and in their right standing and in their effort, Lord, to try and bring goodness to an awful situation. Might they see greatness today, Lord. Your greatness. Father, I pray that right now your greatness is known in the Oval Office. We pray, Lord, for President Biden. Lord, our hearts are heavy. Opinions are rampant. Views are multitude. But Father, we agree as one that as our president sits in that chair behind that desk, that Lord, he would hear your wisdom. Lord, we pray you would send the right counselor. It would seem that there have been wrong counselors in that room, Lord. There have been people who have not shared truth, who have not shared righteousness, who have not shared goodness, and he has listened and acted. Oh, Father, today, send your messenger your Elijah, send your John the Baptist, send your prophet that speaks truth, whoever that might be, Lord, might your words be said, and Father, might they be listened to. Father, work in his heart, in his mind, in his spirit, and Father, we pray that he might see your greatness today. Father, for us, we do not live in a world of hurricanes and viruses and wars. We live in a kingdom that is ruled by you. We live in an environment that is not shrouded by circumstance, but rather by your power. And so, Father, we say once again, how great you are. Oh, Father, your apostle. He shared with us and asked us a question about who can stand against us, who can separate us. And Father, he answered that question. 
trouble, tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or naked, or peril, or sword, will those things separate us from you? Lord, Paul tells us that all things we are overwhelmingly conquering through him who loved us. We join Paul, Lord, and say we are not convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor any other created thing. Lord, we stand confident that none of these things will separate us from the love of Christ that is found only in you. Lord, we stand as testimony. We stand as soldiers. We stand as your elect. We stand, Lord, as those who are chosen. We stand as those who are redeemed and saved by nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, today we pray in his name. Father, today might greatness be seen in every corner of this globe. Might we be its messengers. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. It's in your holy name we pray today, Lord. Amen. Church family, thank you. It, it's a day, isn't it? <laughs> and it's a day that no matter what, we walk out of here confident, regardless of what the newspapers say. Regard, my goodness, regardless of what Facebook says, I know that's hard. Regardless of anything else, we walk out of here confident in the one who saved us. We serve him by faith. Amen. Oh, we leave this place in just a little bit, folks. And we walk into a world that needs to be able to hear and needs to be able to know that by faith we follow him. And that's what Hebrews 11 talks to us about. That's what it says. So in our time remaining this morning, we're going to look at one little verse, Hebrews 11, chapter 4. It's a story that you know. It reflects on something that you probably heard before. And it talks, it's one of our heroes, one of the ones that, that the author of Hebrews says got it right. He stands in, in, in the arena cheering us on as we live our lives by faith. And by faith. This one hero today is one who gives us an example, who gives us encouragement, who cheers us on. He got it right, and we have a chance to get it right today. Stand with me. Hebrews chapter 11, we're beginning in verse 4. By faith. Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous. God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. Now, if you can, turn back to Genesis chapter 4. Take a moment. We want to get that story in context of this person named Abel. Genesis chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. Genesis 4, verse 1. Now the man, this is Adam. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Thank you. you. May be seated. 
It's all about the gift. No. It's all about the condition of the heart of the one who gave the gift. That is what gives it worth. That is what gives it something of value. It is not so much the thing itself as it is the one who gives the thing, the one who sacrifices the thing, the one who offers the thing. We're uh, getting ready to experience the Christmas season. It's 117 days uh, away, by the way, just in case you were wondering. Well, you know, there's that quandary every year that this holiday inflicts upon us because we're supposed to give something, only they aren't gifts, they're presents because we decide the present based upon the person and we put value on the present. You know, that th this is a coworker and so I kind of have this limit here. This is a family member, so I kind of have this, this is my, sp you know, it, it goes up a little bit. We determine the gift based upon, well, you know, what, what our relationship is. And then we have that horrible moment when they give us their gift first and they have spent twice as much as we have on our gift. We have blown our understanding of the formula of the paradigm of gift giving during Christmas time. Woe is us. Well, we know the game we play. We know how that goes. Friends, listen, if we're not careful, we're going to consider our gifts to God in the same light. That God is concerned about the value of the gift we give. The kind of gift we give. He is concerned about the offering and the, because of the dollar signs of the sacrifice based upon what it does for him. But Hebrews comes to us and lets us know it is not about the gift. It is about us. It's about who we are. You know the story of Cain and Abel. You know that the, these first two children of creation, brothers, eventually brought gifts. Abel brought gifts from his labor, his produce, so did Cain. Something about the gift, something about the, the, what was taking place. Abel's gift was received, Cain's gift was rejected. Cain didn't like it very much. He got angry and he got upset and in the process killed his brother. When found out, he was exiled. We understand that the story is very simple. It raises a lot of questions for us. Hebrews gives us the real meaning of the story. It answers the real questions that we might have about what kind of gift are we going to give God? What kind of offering, what kind of sacrifice does he want from us? Just tell us how much to spend, Lord. You just tell us what it's supposed to be and we'll do that and we'll go along our merry way. Well, we need to understand a few things that, that this little story teaches us. And helps us as we understand even a little bit what it means to serve him out there. This is not a stewardship, give your money kind of message, by the way. So you can go ahead and begin listening again. <laughs> this is not one of those, okay, write the check kind of, of thing. There might be an aspect of that you need to listen to. And, and by all means, I hope the Lord speaks where he needs to speak in your heart about that. But this is about something far more than that. The sacrifice, the gift, the offering that those who live by faith give to the Lord. Faith leads to sacrifice. Write it down. Faith leads to sacrifice. Sometimes we think of our relationship to God as a contract. God, I will do this and you'll do that. God, I will be faithful in my money here, and you're going to bless me with money over here. God, I will go ahead and go to church here, and you're going to go ahead and bless my time over here. God, I will show up on Sunday and pray, and on Sunday afternoon, you're going to let my team win the football game. You laugh, maybe a bit nervously. Folks, that whole idea, that theology is called the word of faith theology. 
It's an idea that says that God doesn't want anything but for us to get money and house and relationships. God's greatest desire is for us to be happy. It is a theology that is preached and taught by people like Joel Olstein, people like Joyce Meyer, people like Kenneth Copeland. It is a prosperity gospel. It says that we do, we give what we're supposed to, and now God is obligated contractually to go ahead and give us what we want. The word of faith theology. Isn't it amazing that the word of faith theology has nothing to do with faith has nothing to do with what it is to live by faith and walk by faith it is merely a way a process a formula for me to get what i want or for a televangelist to afford a new airplane friends if anything hebrews 11:4 tells us that our relationship to god is not a contract it is not something that we do our part, he does his part, and everybody's happy. But rather, it is an offering, a sacrifice, not given out of a contract obligation, but given out of a relationship that is defined by a covenant. That it is not, I don't give so we'll have a relationship. I give because we have a relationship. Do you hear that distinction, folks? It is the idea that says that I am giving to God not so I can get something out of him, but because he has already blessed me beyond measure. That's why I give. All of us know what it is to give to get out of trouble. Husbands, you ever bought flowers for your wife? Don't say amen to that. We all get that kind of gift, that kind of offering. But friends, let us not make our gifts to God, our service to God. Let's not make our activity, our time, our energy to God something that somehow just might appease him so we can get something that we want later on. Let it be a gift, an offering, a sacrifice that is by faith celebrating the relationship that already is. Brother Dave, but what about when God's angry? What about when God is wrathful? Shouldn't I give him something that will somehow let him, let his wrath subside? Shouldn't I go ahead and give a little bit more because of, after all, I've done something kind of wrong this week. If I put a little bit more in the offering plate, so to speak, maybe, maybe God will feel better about it and he'll overlook it. Friend, listen, that is horrible theology. That might put more money in the offering plate, but it does nothing for your relationship to God. Let me tell you, there is only one offering. There is only one sacrifice. There is only one gift that changes how God looks at you, and that is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Only through him, only his shed blood. His is the only sacrifice of atonement. His is the only sacrifice that creates the relationship to begin with. That's the whole point of the book of Hebrews, by the way. The whole idea of Hebrews is looking at past attempts of sacrifice and saying those are inadequate, that the only sacrifice is the one offered, as Hebrews talks about, by this great high priest, that it's only through Jesus that we hope to have anything of a relationship with God. Hebrews 9.12 says, not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, Jesus entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. Our eternal redemption. You want to get right with God. It's not found in a checkbook. It's not found in teaching a Sunday school lesson. It's not found in giving out tracts on the corner. You want a right relationship with God. It is only found at the feet of Jesus by faith. And then that faith leads us to give as we continue to grow in our faith. Faith leads to sacrifice and faith leads to personal sacrifice i want you to notice i want you to notice that uh, abel gave who he was 
He gave of the results of his, of his work, of his produce. Cain did the same. The gift you give is because God has already given you. He's already given who you are and what you do. And the gift you give is something that shows your relationship to him through what he has already done in your life. That was Abel's great testimony. God, you have given me the flocks. I give you back the first that I've received. I give you, I sacrifice to you, I offer to you that which expresses what you have given me. Cain had that very same opportunity. You're going to listen to some folks who tell you that Cain's sacrifice was rejected because it wasn't a blood sacrifice, because it didn't follow the, uh, the sacrificial code that was in place. The problem is there wasn't a sacrificial code in place until the book of Exodus, folks. Cain offered a gift, a sacrifice. The problem wasn't the sacrifice. The problem was Cain. The problem was his heart. That it wasn't given out of relationship. It was given out of pride. It was given out of standing. It was given out of look what I can do. Evidence completely by his response when that offering was rejected. He wasn't broken hearted. He wasn't in despair. He wasn't questioning, confused. He was angry and he got violent because of the anger. The sacrifice that he offered was all about him and nothing about the God that he offered the sacrifice to. Abel is the one who took what he had and gave it to the Lord, expressing a relationship, and he was counted righteous in his heart. Not because the sacrifice put it there, but because there's something about this first child of creation, second child of creation, that somehow said, God is more important than the gift that I give. And we face the same thing. For we give of who we are. We don't give a blood sacrifice this Sunday. I mean, I've checked. There is no burning altar out there for us. Now, for the, uh, for the block party tonight, there will be a griddle cooking hamburgers, okay? That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the fact that this sacrifice that we give is not found in goats and bulls. It's not found in those kind of sacrifices. It's found in God giving us and us celebrating our relationship to him by faith, giving back to him that which he's made. You have been gifted. You have been placed. You have been put where you are in your circumstance so that God can use you. Your act of service, your act of love, your act of worship is that offering that comes back to him, not so that you might curry favor with him, but that you might celebrate who he is in your life. He's a, a figure of Chisholm Heights Baptist Church that many of you know the story. Many of you know who he is. Some uh, have, have been part of the family, come into the family since he went on to be with the Lord. His name was Leonard Reeves. Y'all remember, some of y'all remember Brother Leonard? Brother Leonard would, uh, uh, what was our, our head usher, whenever he was talking to you, he'd always kind of look through his bifocals a little bit down his nose at you so he could get you, trifocals I think, so he could get you in the right focus. The problem was that Leonard was not exactly a man of big stature, so many times he was looking up at you as he was trying to look down to be able to see you. He was a man who knew who he was. He told stories many times, uh, especially the later years, he told the same stories about his service in World War II and the those kind of things. Leonard was a man who'd been part of our church for a very, very, very long time. But even before he came to our church, he had service. And for Brother Leonard, that was being usher. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, Leonard knew his calling. Leonard served as usher. For decades, the man served as usher. More than once I had a conversation with him as we were talking about some different things and talking about uh, the, uh, the, the things that need to be done. And invariably he would make this comment to me in one form or another. 
He would say, Brother Dave, I can't preach a sermon. I would probably think that, yeah, that would be extremely difficult maybe for him. Brother Dave, I can't sing a song. Okay, I, I would take his word for that. I don't know, but he says he couldn't sing a song. I really can't teach a Sunday school lesson. I don't have a lot of money to give. But the one thing I know I can do is that I can meet somebody when they come into the house of the Lord and I can give them a bulletin and a smile and a handshake and help them find a place to be seated. I can't do all those other kind of things, Brother Dave, but I can be an usher. Leonard got it, you know? Leonard's one of Chisholm Heights Baptist Church heroes, Hebrews 11 kind of hero. Oh, he had... Stuff. I mean, you know, he, he, he didn't walk a few feet above the ground. I never saw a halo over his head or anything like that. But he got it. He understood that his offering to God was the very best of what God had already given him. And he stands along with Abel to let us know that our faith leads to sacrifice and it leads to a personal sacrifice what you got where's god placed you what's he put you what will your faith give and that faith leads to significance to meaning the gift that god all of us have received gifts that we don't want and sometimes we experience a rather new thing that has at least a new name to it. It's called re-gifting, where you hang on to a gift that you really don't want, and then you give it away at the next party or something like that. And every once in a while, you sit in fear, hoping, is the person who gave it to me going to be in attendance at the party and remember that they gave it to me that I'm giving away to somebody else? We know the little game that we play with that. What is it the gift? What is the gift that God wants? What is the gift that really has significance, that really has meaning? Cain, his gift had no legacy. It had no meaning, no significance to it, not because of the gift, but because of his heart. He gave out of something to get something. But Abel, Abel's gift significant that Hebrews tells us he still speaks. He still has a voice. He still allows us to understand what sacrifice is and this sacrifice of faith. We have this roll call of faith in Hebrews 11. But you have your own roll call, don't you? You got your own group of people that have made a difference in your life. A group of people that uh, their gift has been significant. And they might have gone on to be with the Lord, but they still speak. I venture to say they still speak. Because they offered, they gave by faith. Me, I'm blessed. I've got a lot of people I could put in that list. Mr. Dill, a Sunday school teacher. Dr. Huff, an English professor. Isn't it amazing how some of our heroes aren't heroes at the time, we don't think? It until we get away from them, we realize just how powerful a hero they truly are. Thank you, Dr. Huff. <laughs> I think of uh, Dwayne Gooch, the businessman, deacon. I think of Sandy Stark, a neighbor, a deacon. Yeah. Men, and there are plenty of women in that list as well who have given their time, their love, 
their care, their energy, their dollars by faith. And somehow they spoke. And I promise you, they are still speaking in my life today. And that leads us to the question, what kind of voice do you have? Your gift, your offering, your sacrifice, will it speak after the cash is checked? After the check is cashed, I'm sorry, I knew that didn't sound right. Will your gift, that was profound, let me back up and try it one more time, folks. Will your gift still speak after the check is cashed? Will your gift speak after the quarterly is closed and the lesson comes to an end? Will your gift still speak after the song is sung, after the meal is served, Will your gift still speak after the phone call ends? You see, it's not the gift. It's the heart of the one who gives by faith. By faith. A faith that proclaims God's greatness in a world that is anything but great. A faith. Father, I pray today that by faith we give. That Lord, today is a day where our sacrifice and our offering come before you. Lord, I pray for the one here today who has never received you as Savior. Lord, they're still trying to curry your favor by attending church or reading a bi their Bible or, or, Lord, putting money in an offering plate. They're trying to do good, hoping you'll take notice. Lord, I pray today that they might realize the only atonement sacrifice is found in Jesus. And might they receive that gift of eternal life. Might they open their hearts and lives today, Lord. I pray for my friends who love you, who are trying their best, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would bless them by faith. Encourage them this day, Lord. We lift up our head and we trust you with full confidence by faith. Thank you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen.